Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Voices for Change 2.0, the only podcast that focuses on mental health while mixing in movies, music, books, sports, and pop culture. Here are your hosts, Rebecca and Joe Lombardo. Hey, good Saturday morning to you. We hope that your weekend is off to a great start. Welcome to Voices for Change 2.0. Hey, good morning, and welcome to the show. Uh, we have a very special guest that will be joining us shortly. He uh, unfortunately has come down with a sinus infection, and we feel really badly to be dragging him out of bed and having him uh, call us and talk to us today. So uh, that being said, make sure that uh, uh, you guys uh, – Send him a quick shout out later on and let him know that we hope that you hope he feels better. Yeah. And uh, so for today, we're talking to someone that I have a great deal of respect for, not just for his courage in speaking out about the obstacles he has had to overcome in his life, but because he works so hard to help others along the way. Uh, Matt Pappas is not just a blogger, a podcaster an author, and an advocate, he's a survivor. We are really looking forward to talking to him today because this is a topic that we haven't yet tackled. And as you know, our show is all about awareness. So without any fault or all, let's bring in our guest. Good morning, Matt. Hey, guys. How you doing? Hey, good morning. Thanks for joining us, Matt. Absolutely. My pleasure. How are you feeling? Oh, I've been better, but I'm going to uh, power through. I have what <clears throat> everybody else seems to be having these days around here, where I live at least, is some kind of crazy sinus infection, but uh, I'll manage. No worries at all. Okay. Where are you calling from? I live in central Pennsylvania, south central oh, Pennsylvania okay. to be exact. So. Okay. okay, well, that's plenty far enough away from us, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't worry. We don't, I'll try and not spread it out your way, I promise. <laughs> we we appreciate that. We've been trying really hard all, all all winter to not get sick, so don't blow it for us. Yeah, really, that's the, the last thing we need in addition to everything else we've got going on. So, um, But we do appreciate that you uh, still wanted to go through the show with us. Uh, I know how hard it is to you know, even function during a sinus infection and anything else, any other type of illness. So, like I said, we do appreciate it. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. And I know this is an important topic, and you guys do a great show, and I wanted to make sure that I was a part of it. So I'm I'm stoked and honored, and I will give it my absolute best shot to, uh, to answer all your questions and, uh, you know, do whatever it is you guys need me to do. Awesome. Thank you. We, we we look forward to watching you dance the jig later then. <laughs> <laughs> you don't ever want to see me dance, man. Like, not ever. It's not pretty. Sick or not, it's not a pretty thing. Do you have any questions for us before we go on? No, huh? No. I think I'm, uh, I think I'm about as ready to go as I can get. So, uh, yeah, let's just jump right into it whenever you guys are ready. Okay. All right. Awesome. We'll jump right in. Uh, to... Protect our listeners. I don't want to go into too much detail. I don't want uh, our discussion to be triggering for anyone or to make anyone feel uncomfortable. However, I do want you to be able to tell your story. So uh, is it safe to say that you experienced abuse on several levels as you were growing up? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it was I mean, the main part of the abuse, I guess you want to say the main part or what started it out was um, <clears throat> childhood sexual abuse that happened um, at the hands of a neighbor kid up the street. And then that kind of, uh, that was like what started it when I was five to 10. And then that kind of snowballed into the uh, narcissistic abuse from uh, my mother when I was growing up and the bullying when I was in elementary and middle school. So um, it was sexual, it was verbal, it was uh, emotional, it was all kinds of stuff. But I guess what what could really have set things in motion, for lack of a better term, would have been 
um, you know, what happened to me um, at the hands of that teenager up the street when I was uh, five to ten. Wow. Okay. That's that's wild. Yeah. yeah and, that's, and, we're, and we're both so sorry that you went through that. Definitely. I, I hate that for you, and I, I really do. I really feel so badly that you had to go through that. Um, were you able to, to reach out to, you know, a trusted adult to get any kind of help? Well, unfortunately, um, a lot of times when somebody is abused on any level, but, um, you know, especially when it's something that involves like sexual abuse, you're groomed mm-hmm. to the point where you're made to um, feel like you can't tell anybody, you can't trust anybody, you'll break a secret bond that you have with your abuser because you're special. And if you tell somebody then you'll never be able to be that special person again. Um, you are sometimes threatened to the point where, you know, they would harm you or your family or your friends or your pets if you told somebody. So there's all different types of grooming that goes on when you're in the middle of abuse. And especially when you're a child and you have no idea what's going on and somebody yeah. that you trust is doing things to you that should never be done but they're rationalizing it and making it seem like it's a good thing. So after a while you start to almost believe it. And to that point, you know, oftentimes it's very common that people don't reach out for help because they're either afraid to, or they're ashamed to, or they're just basically groomed that what they're, that what's happening is normal and that there's no need to. So to answer your question, no, I I didn't reach out for anybody or tell anybody until decades later, really. So it's kind of just to follow up. It's it's almost. I don't think this is the exact same type of situation, but it's almost kind of like a Stockholm syndrome kind of thing, where you you kind of you go along start with to it connect in a way. with your abuser. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it can be, and obviously Stockholm syndrome can be an absolute big part of it. Um, mm-hmm. It really all depends on the situation, and you know, especially. It's a lot easier to groom a child, obviously, than, than an adult um, because, right. you know, even though I was, you know, like I left the abuser's house every time, but I kept going back because he, he told me I was special. He told me I was cool. This is what cool kids do. He told me I wouldn't get a ride on his motorcycle anymore on, on, him, on his uh, dirt bike, you know, his little mini bike if I didn't keep doing this. So in my effort to fit in and to be with a cool kid, and to hang out with somebody who thought, you know, who was about 16, and here I am, you know, some little kid who's not even in, you know, five or ten yet. For somebody to think that I'm super cool and I'm worth hanging out, I must have to keep doing what he's doing because that just – because that, that, that'll ensure that he won't hurt me, that I'll get to ride the motorcycle more, and that he'll keep thinking that I'm a cool kid. And, and someday when I'm in school, he'll be sure and tell people how cool I am. Those were some of the things that he told me, and – being a little kid trying to fit in, um, I bought right into it and, you know, it just, it happens so often because kids are so easily influenced. And I mean, when you're that young, you just have no idea, you know, that something that is happening, um, like that is really bad for you because people are telling the people who you trust are telling you that it's good. So you're like, okay. And even though it doesn't feel right and it's scary, and it's emotionally and, and, and physically painful, you keep going back because that's what you're groomed to do and that's what your mind keeps telling you. Yeah, absolutely. Did any of the adults around you start to question why you would be spending so much time with that um, teenager or was everybody just kind of, you know, I would hate to say oblivious, but do you do you feel anything towards the other adults around you that maybe they they could have helped you manage it better? Well, he was the son of a family friend up the street. Like <clears throat> his dad worked at the local garage where my parents always took their car, so my parents knew him. His mom knew my mom, so they were family friends. And mm-hmm. so it was pretty much like, um, you know, nobody ever knew anything. I mean, other than what only he knew and I knew, I never told anybody else. And um, so, you know, I didn't, I didn't want to reach out to anybody because, 
you know, obviously I was groomed not to, but also, but because I was ashamed to the point where I, it's a, it's a very weird combination of being ashamed, being fearful, but also wanting to fit in. And oftentimes that desire to fit in and that over time influence of you're doing the right thing because this is what you should be doing. If you want to have X, Y, and Z happen in the future, you just end up buying in hook, line, and sinker, and before you know it, you're going back every day, every day, every week, every week, month after month, and experiencing the same thing for what you are perceived as being told as it's right, it's normal, it's what cool kids do. So, no, no other adults knew. I never told anybody, and, um, you know, to this day, I mean, I, I don't know if his parents ever found out or not. I have no idea where he is or what he's been doing ever since the abuse ended. Wow. So when were you able to get help and, uh, you know, how long did it take for you to begin the journey of, of healing that you, that you've been on so that you could, you know, help yourself and help other people along the way? Well, um, in my, I'm going to say, mid now about early early 20s or so um my parents out of the blue decided that they wanted to send me to a therapist against my wishes and I didn't want to go and I thought it was pointless because I had basically just suppressed these feelings after it was over to the point where I just tried to pretend they didn't exist nothing ever happened it is what it is right. I'm just going to move on and forget about it so they sent me to this therapist the therapist ended up um, over time talking with me and, you know, it came out that I was sexually abused as a child and I had been bullied in school and all of this stuff. And so that was the first time that I had ever told like anybody ever. But what happened was after some of those visits, the therapist ended up breaking the confidence and telling my parents what happened. And oh, my. then my parents, yeah. So she broke the confidence. She broke, I mean, Te- technically the law, I mean, if you want to get technical, but she ended up yeah. telling my parents what happened. I had no idea that she told them. My parents confronted me. I, like, completely lost it emotionally. I'm like, no, it didn't happen. No, it wasn't true. Leave me alone. I'm fine. It was fine. And, like, I tried to rationalize some – I tried to rationalize how good it was again 15 years later that I was okay oh, and nothing mattered. Yeah. So at that point, then, um, I totally – really, really emotionally shut down, like absolutely, like totally. I never, I never spoke of it again. I didn't tell anybody. Like I completely alienated myself from my parents. Um, it was pretty much uh, almost like being re-traumatized all over again because now people knew that I didn't trust telling in the first place. Now they knew. Now they ended up telling other people, telling people in the mm. church, people in my family, people, friends. Oh, my God, Matt was sexually abused. I'm getting calls and, and notes and letters from people saying I'm praying for you. I'm like, what are you talking about? And here I come to find right. out that my parents had told all these people. And, you know, whether or not their, their in, intentions were pure, which, you know, you know, doesn't matter. The point is, you know, they told people when they weren't supposed to because the therapist told somebody when she wasn't supposed to. And it started this chain reaction of total distrust throughout my entire life that lasted for a really long time. So after that, wow. I spent the next, couple of decades after that, uh, after those events, really just not really trusting anybody, just trying to live my life, just trying to pretend it didn't happen. I'm fine. It happened a long time ago. It doesn't affect me. And I pretty much suppressed it all over again for the next 20 some years after that happened. So for about 30 years, I, you know, save for that, for that short time of, um, being re-traumatized. I, 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 I never spoke of it that I can recall. Wow. So what finally kind of turned you around and got you to where, you know, I need to, I need to confront this and try and make peace or, you know, seek some kind of healing out of it. Well, basically after my second divorce in uh, 2013, um, I decided that I needed to seek some help, not for this, but for, mm-hmm. because my life was kind of crashing down around me. I'm, I'm, I'm in my early forties and now I'm a, a single dad again. 
and I have to pick up the pieces of my life and keep going. So I sought the help of a therapist, mostly just to help me kind of get my head back on straight, as I like to say, to kind of get some perspective in my life, get some new direction, and kind of get my, my sea legs again to move forward after I had been divorced for a second time. So I saw I, I found a therapist through work, and I started seeing her. And, and after about six months of working through various relationship questions and life questions and just like general counseling, um, it came out in a session in the summer of 20 – I'm going to guess summer of 2014 that I, uh, that I had been sexually abused as a child and I had been, you know, the victim of narcissistic abuse and bullying and like randomly, honestly, it came out of nowhere. Like it wasn't a conversation topic. It wasn't a workbook topic. It was just, I had this memory and this is what it was. And then we started diving into that for the whole next year. It was <clears throat> childhood sexual abuse, um, memories, you know, uh, invalidation at home, why I felt this way, what happened, why, you know, what these feelings meant. And I started to really put two and two together as to why my life had been spent so far feeling the way that I did, why I had trust issues, why I had problems connecting with people, why I had codependency problems in relationships. All these things were finally starting to click as to what was going on. So, you know, the therapist who was amazing at the time, um, you know, really worked with me and kind of helped me understand that for the first time that I was a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. And when the first time that, that, that I realized that I was a survivor, like everything just kind of came into focus. And I really started to like dive headfirst, you know, jumping with both feet into healing. I started reading books, watching videos. I started journaling. Um, and then in early 2016, I started um, <clears throat> my blog, survivingmypast.net, to kind of step up my game a little bit from just the regular journaling, you know, for personal gain, you know, or I'm sorry, for like personal help, personal reasons. Right. I started taking it to another level because I wanted to start helping other people because I figured that there had to be other people who were like I was. And obviously there are. I mean, there's 7 right. billion mm -hmm. people in this world and, you know, I mean, just you know, boys and girls are are sexually abused um, to this day all the time, and it's sad. And as adults, we live with it, and we live with the shame and with the heartache and the frustration and the confusion of why it happened. So, I want to do my part to help inspire people and realize that you know that you know you're not completely broken. You aren't doomed to a life of solitude and despair and loneliness because something happened to you when you were a, when you were a child that wasn't your fault. And so, you know, one of the mo what I guess really kind of keeps me going is the fact that I want to keep healing. I want to inspire others and that, you know, this isn't a problem that happened once or twice and then it has gone away. I mean, one right. in four girls and one in six boys are sexually abused before their 18th birthday. I mean, that's like startling, scary stuff. And it's happening today. And so I need to do what I can to help myself continue to heal, but to help inspire others to be aware, to realize that they're worth healing if they were abused, to help others, and just really raise awareness and take it to the highest level that I possibly can because I don't want anybody else to ever have to go through what I did and feel the way that I did, feeling so alone and ashamed. Well, we're grateful to you to for you know for coming out and trying to help others. <clears throat> pardon me. I, I beg your pardon. Um, we, uh, you know, that's what this show is founded on is, you know, the, the belief that we're here to help others and through our struggles, we can do that. So we're grateful to you to come out, you know, and, and speak about these things so that other people know that, I mean, alone. yeah, you know, I mean, I think everybody, experiences things differently and you know perhaps they know on some level that they're not alone but maybe hearing your story kind of clicks with them and they realize that it's it's time for them to get help so you know like I said we're really grateful for you to come out and and talk about this with us so um, having said that we are going to take a very quick break 
Uh, and during that break, we will be listening to a song by Annie Baltic called All By Myself. The clips on you <laughs> Eat popcorn and pack yeah. Covers on my head yeah. FaceTime until I fall asleep The sleep Guess I shouldn't be complaining Put no. my cares away And let me free Be me yeah. You can close your eyes and see Dream OMG amazing Make believe Welcome back to Voices for Change 2.0. Hey there. Uh, I'm Rebecca Lombardo, and... I'm Joe, and that was Annie Baltic with her song All By Myself. Thank you, Annie. Absolutely. And on our guest, our guest today, rather, is uh, Matt Pappas. He is an author, a blogger, a podcaster, and an advocate. And he really is at the forefront of of assisting survivors of child sexual abuse as well as bullying. And we're really glad to have him on the show today. Uh, Matt, we'll jump right back into the questions if you don't mind. Sure. Absolutely. Go for it. Cool. Um, So since you came out and started telling your story, has it been a positive experience for you? Have you, have you seen, or heard from uh, other other survivors like yourself saying, you know, hey, thank you for for coming forward, you know, that type of thing. 
Yeah, I mean, when I first started talking about it in blog form and going online and in, uh, interacting with um, other survivors – and survivor chats and whatnot, it was scary. I mean, I mean, I'll admit, you know, when you go out and put yourself out there and say, Hey, I was a victim of childhood sexual abuse. And you know, that's, there is a gigantic stigma around mental health in general, but you know, people just don't want to Mm -hmm. talk about what happened to them 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. They'd rather just leave it buried in the past and pretend it didn't exist. But um, when you really, when you really start to, uh, deep dive into, as I like to say, into your past and, and understand that so much of the way that you are is um, affected by what happened to you, that understanding helps you be able to be kinder to yourself, to, excuse me, kinder to yourself, to validate yourself, and then to be able to work through the feelings that you have. And that's what I found other people have been able to relate to the most is that feeling of not being alone. I get comments on my blog, um, <clears throat> excuse me, podcasters who want, or excuse me, people who want to be on my podcast, people who leave me, um, you know, DMs on Twitter and whatnot, just saying thank you for writing your story, thank you for sharing, um, thank you as a guy speaking out, um, especially yeah. mm-hmm. um, because I mean, you know, for for better or for worse, it's often the easier, and I and I say easier delicately for a woman to speak out than this for a guy. And it's it's never easy. I mean, it it just doesn't. It's scary. But guys have this pride, this man card, this this self perceived, you know, I have to be tough, whatever type yeah. of mindset that we don't want to admit that something terrible happened to us, and then reach out and ask for help because we don't want to be ashamed or ridiculed. We don't want people at the office to know. We don't want family members to know, or friends, or the church, or whoever. So we oftentimes just keep our mouth shut for a variety of reasons. But when you start to really share your story and you see that there are just millions of people around the world who have been through similar circumstance and feeling the same way that you are feeling for any particular reason, it's, it's really empowering because the the biggest problem, or I guess the worst feeling is that feeling of being alone. Like, you know, I, I've been abused. I'm broken. I'm damaged. Nobody's going to want to be my friend if I tell them what happened. So I better keep it silent. But when you open up yeah. and, and, and you see other people who get inspired by you opening up and then you inspire them to open up and then they inspire other people, that's how you really start to re- you know, take this whole awareness thing to a whole new level to where you're not just talking about it, but you're doing something about it by engaging with others and encouraging them to do something. And then they encourage somebody else to do something, whether it's seeking help so they can heal themselves, where they can reach out to others, where they maybe write a book, write a song, do some artwork. Anything that – any good that can come from something so horrible is only going to be there. I mean, you know, is really just something amazing that um, can really take off and inspire so many. I mean, nobody ever wishes yeah. this past. I mean, you just don't. Like, I don't wish what happened to me or my worst enemy ever. But it right. happened, and then, you know, I practice radical acceptance and the fact that it happened. I can't change it but I can move forward and have the life I want because I deserve that. And, and I can help other people have the life that they want because they, they don't have to feel ashamed because it wasn't their fault. They didn't ask for it. Um, you know, all the, all these different things that you work through. So yeah, it's been a, a hugely positive impact for me in so many ways from, from others that, that have reached out to me and just by, um, validating myself and writing it out because, you know, when you write something out, and you get people responding back with encouragement. It just it goes a long way. Yeah, it helps to it reinforces that you know you're doing good. You're being selfless and, and putting yourself out there, and it, it really does. It, it shows people, hey, I, I'm not alone. You know, we've seen that with Beck with her book, and you know, people approaching her, hey, I, you know, your story really resonated with me, and. So yeah, and to have have it be your message that's coming out, and you know, we've talked about the the child sexual abuse, obviously, but you know, you also mentioned the uh, narcissistic abuse and the bullying. Um, you know, that's tough. You know, and and to really stop and take stock of 
your own life and then to see some someone like you come out and and talk about it and go well, wow yeah i went through that too you know and you know just helping people realize you know it's it's just it's it's an amazing amazing thing you know and to piggyback what you're on what you were saying about um men and their ability to speak out i know i i've even recently uh spoken to someone uh, a gentleman who has felt left out of um the discussion with uh, you know something like eating disorders you know uh, that he really felt as if you know he was sort of pushed to the side because it's 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 a woman's issue and and there are certain things that yes we can sit down and we can call it a woman's issue uh, when it relates specifically to a woman's body or things like that but it's important to remember that men go through these things too men get depressed men have bipolar disorder men consider suicide men are abused they can be sexually harassed at work i mean it's 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 really important that we uh, you know as much as we have been fighting for the awareness for women's issues we need to bring the men's issues to the forefront as well. And I know that you use many different methods to uh, help survivors of abuse. And I just did, I wanted to mention really quickly that you do also write a column for it's the good men project, correct? Yeah. 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 That's a, um, that's a website um, that, um, I write for weekly, as you said, and it's basically, it's not just a mental health website. It, it, it's a website where men and women write about issues that affect, um, you know, men, but also their families and their work and their careers. And it's really just a place for men to reach out and to raise awareness for topics that they believe in, to share what's on their heart and for, you know, to really engage, not just men, obviously, but women too, because it's not, it's men standing up and having the conversation that nobody wants to have about whatever the particular topic may be. So my, mm-hmm. you know, the column, the column that I write for is, um, you know, it's basically uh, sometimes it's original work that I put out. Sometimes it's a post that's been on my blog before, but I use that to help reach an, an audience um, of just, you know, millions of people every month that go to that website to inspire men and their families to really just, um, you know, be aware of of the stigma that's around mental health and to try and erase that by doing our own individual part. So, yeah, um, I do write for – it's an honor to write for them. I was also in a a video uh, with them that was put out, oh, about a month ago uh, for their uh, mental health social interest group which a bunch of us got together for about six weeks on a conference call once per week. And we decided to do a video PSA um, to about men who were speaking out because they, they suffer from depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts um, because they were abused. They have, um, you know, all these different types of things that men oftentimes don't ever talk about because it's not the manly thing to do. You know, we we came up with a hashtag called Not Weak, Just Human, and we made a video PSA, and we all wrote articles about it. And uh, I was honored to be a part of that because I spoke out that, hey, I'm a survivor of childhood sexual abuse, bullying, and narcissistic abuse, but I spoke out and got help, and I'm not ashamed. And that's, and that's, that's, what, really, that's what, you know, the Good Men Project tries to do. That's what I try and do is it's inspire men and women, everybody, to just realize that it's not a, a guy or a gal issue. It's just a human issue. It's a people issue right. when, you know, it really is. I mean, you know, like you guys said, sexual abuse, depression, suicidal thoughts, um, you know, all these different types of self-esteem problems, body image issues, eating disorders. Like this affects guys as much as it does, any, um, you know, women. It's just that guys don't ever talk about it. We don't speak up about it. We don't report it. Um, you know, it's yeah, a, we're, we're not it's allowed a shame to that feel. That's exactly right. You are exactly right. Uh, guys are not supposed to feel. We're just supposed to mm-hmm. be the strong people, the breadwinners. They take care of everybody else. Don't let on that you're hurt, you know, because you don't want to, you know, for any number of reasons. So, 
yeah, absolutely. I try to do my part as much as possible, and, and writing for GMP is a big part of that. That's that's awesome. I I need to look at I need to look into that. Yeah, definitely. And and let me just say one more time for any gentlemen out there that are listening that that feel as if they may not have a voice, please do visit the uh, the Good Men Project on Twitter or uh, find their website and kind of take a look around there because I think you'll find a more acceptance than what you have been experiencing before. So, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about your personal website and uh, what people will find when they visit? Uh, sure. Yeah, um, the website, uh, of course, is survivingmypast.net. started in uh, early 2016. Um, it, it started out as basically a blog, just a, just a place for me to write down my thoughts. Um, in addition to, you know, writing in, in a, you know, in, in, in just like a personal diary or journal. So mm-hmm. that website has grown into a blog, podcast, videos uh, on YouTube, uh, Periscope videos. Um, it's really kind of just blossomed into something that I was really hoping it would be, but wasn't necessarily anticipating that it would be a place <laughs> where I can, um, yeah, like a place where I can share my thoughts, be open and honest, write about issues that I want to raise awareness about, feelings, thoughts, um, things that I've been through. Um, I use it as a platform for others to be guest bloggers. So I've got a bunch of people who write for me on a regular basis um, or just one time people, you know, you know, who don't, they'll share their story and that's it. And uh, it can be anything about their personal story or a mental health topic that they are passionate about. Um, I have people who are on my podcast as guest hosts, sometimes therapists or advocates or coaches or, um, you know, just other survivors like me who want to share their story and, kind of come out from the shadows, so to speak. So it's, it's a website that really is just, it's my story, but it's also so many other people's stories and it's there um, to help everybody have a voice who maybe otherwise wouldn't be able to for some particular reason. So, um, you know, it's an honor for me to share the stories of others. It's an honor for me to share my story and to really help raise awareness as much as possible. So it pretty much you'll find videos, blog posts, and podcasts there um, every week that I put up or that uh, guest bloggers put up. That's All very right. cool. That's, that's awesome. Uh, I think we are going to take one more quick break. Uh, we will be right back with Matt Pappas. And uh, hang on there with us. Don't miss the Mental Health Memoir of the Year, It's Not Your Journey. It's Not Your Journey is the true story of one woman's 20-year battle with mental illness and her recovery from a suicide attempt in 2013. Rebecca Lombardo candidly reveals her real and raw emotions in dealing with depression, bipolar disorder, the loss of her mother and brother, and more. Pick it up today on Amazon.com or visit www.RebeccaLombardo.com for more information. Thank you for joining us. We're back with Voices for Change 2.0. We are just having a comedy of errors in the uh, recording booth here today with Joe and myself. So we just wanted to send an apology to our guests and apology to our listeners. We... uh, had a really late late night last night and we're not completely uh firing on all cylinders yeah exactly we're we're <laughs> i know the feeling trust we're, me <laughs> <laughs> we're having a little bit of uh trouble here so um forgive us please we uh don't want to do a disservice to our guests so we're just gonna uh keep keep on going with the questions and uh Make sure that his message is heard. So, Joe, you have a question? I do. Um, And actually, Beck and I were were kind of talking about this last night and thought, you know, maybe we we would ask you about this and and get your outlook on it. Um, How do you feel, Matt, about the use of the word victim? Do you think we've come to a place where it needs to be removed from the discussion or is it still necessary uh, use this term in in these type of situations, and what where I'm coming from with it is, you know, people will be talking with them and and they'll say, I'm not a victim. Don't call me a victim, you know. 
I just what what are your what's your two cents on it? What do you how do you feel about this? Well, it's an interesting topic because a victim implies that you were helpless and that you have no control over your situation. When in essence, that's exactly what happened. Um, you know, oh, right. if you are a survivor of abuse, and and, and I, I speak from the abuse perspective because that's what I know the best. That's what I have my experience in, I guess, for lack of a better term. But, I mean, right. the fact is is that especially as a child, I mean, you absolutely 100% were a victim. I mean, you had no say in it. You were groomed. You were led to believe. You were uh, just going along with somebody that you thought was trustworthy. So you absolutely were a victim at some point mm-hmm. in time for for any 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 length of time, whether it was a one time uh, you know event, whether it happened twice, ten times over years and years, you were absolutely a victim. So, but I think what happens though over time is if you stay in the victim the victim mentality for too long, that's when you stay stuck and you can't heal. And I mean. I'm here to absolutely validate everyone who's been through something like I have been through because you were absolutely a victim. You were, you know, you were uh, traumatized in a way that nobody should ever be traumatized. It was not your fault. And, and, you know, you can never, ever, ever blame a child, you know, for, for not being able to fight off or to rationalize, you know, why something shouldn't be happening when you, you know, barely have no idea what life is about in the first place. So, You know, over time, though, as you start to reach out for healing, um, you start to kind of realize that, yes, I was a victim, but, you know, this event, that event happened. Now, what can I do to move forward so I'm not stuck in a life of despair and loneliness and sadness and feel like I'm not worthy and, you know, nothing I do is going to amount to anything? So you kind of go from victim to surviving, to thriving, to conquer, which is where I came up with the survive, thrive, conquer thing is, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's really what it kind of born, what was born out of was you were a victim of something, you survived it, um, you know, in, into adulthood. And as you start to heal, you begin to realize that you were a victim and you were surviving. Now you're going to try and thrive which means that you're going to use the tools that you've been learning through therapy, through books, through videos, through journaling, whatever it is that you're doing to help yourself, artwork, music, crafts, whatever. You're using that, that empowered feeling, those tools that you're getting to really help yourself not feel as stuck and to realize that you're worthy of, you know, the life that, you know, everybody else has that you want, that you're worthy to be able to have a good career, to have a family, to have a spouse, to have friends, to be able to go out and do right. things and not let your abuse rule your life and keep you stuck all the time. So, you know, very it's, it's very hard to go from one step to the next. And also, honestly, when you do, you oftentimes will bounce back and forth between surviving and thriving and thriving and surviving because you're really, right. you know, I mean, every day is a struggle. And some days you feel like you're on top of the world and nothing can go wrong and you feel great. And then other days you just feel like the world's crashing in on you and you're a victim again and everything stinks and somebody invalidated you at work or a family or, you know, something got something uh, caused you to be triggered. And so, you know, it's really a constant battle. And some days are easier than others and some days are a lot harder than others. But it really is the fact that you were a victim, but the key to the healing is to not stay in that victim mindset and really realize that you are worth healing and having a life that you have always dreamed of. Absolutely. And, and you know, the reason that I came up with that question was, like Joe said, that we've heard that, you know, folks have said, you know, don't call me a victim. And, and you know, we're we're certainly not – saying that they're not allowed to say that, you know, there's, there's been instances where, um, you know, I've been told that recently now in the conversation, when it comes to suicide, um, the word commit needs to be removed from the conversation because that makes it sound like some sort of a crime. Uh, you know, you commit a crime, you don't commit suicide. So now we say they died by suicide or they attempted suicide or what have you. So 
Um, I think we're all learning as as things progress, um, what is right and what is wrong in each of these situations. And I just wanted to make sure that people know that, you know, I, I personally, if, if someone experienced child sexual abuse, if I say that they were a, a victim of, of abuse, I don't look at them as a victim now. I look at their life back then as a child. Yes, they were a victim, like you said. Now they're a survivor. But I I just want people to know, to know that, you know, there are those of us out there that understand the difference between being a victim and being a survivor and that you can be both. Essentially, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you are. You're exactly right, and it, it's really just, it's really realizing, honestly, how much you feel you are worth healing. And so, oftentimes, when you're an abuse survivor of any type of abuse, whether it's domestic or emotional or sexual or whatever the type of abuse was, you feel like you aren't worth healing, and. Um, until until we kind of overcome that to the point where we realize that we are uh, important, that 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 our story is important, that getting out and getting help is important. Until we get to that point, we do often stay stuck and feel like a victim. But once you take that very first step, everyone just gets the slightest bit easier to keep moving forward. But that first step is absolutely the hardest one yeah. and the most right. important. One. Yeah, definitely. Now, in addition to your regular podcast, which, as you said, is on survivingmypast.net, they can find the information there. You have a very interesting way that you spend your Sunday mornings. Could you briefly uh, discuss that with us? Yeah. um, About a month ago, as of the time that we are, you know, having this show here, I started doing a Sunday morning Periscope series, which is on Twitter. Basically, it's like Facebook Live, but only it's for Twitter. So I basically just go live via my phone, and I <clears throat> read through a book called You Won Anxiety Zero. It's by my friend who is a psychotherapist, and also, you know, as I said, my friend Jody Amen. She wrote this book to help, uh, help everybody who reads it understand what anxiety is, what it makes you feel like, why you feel the way you do, and ways that you can really – combat anxiety and really kind of kick it to the side and not let it rule your life because anxiety affects 40 million people in just the U.S. alone every year. I mean, it's it's a huge, huge thing, and it affects everybody in different ways, but the tips and the tricks that anxiety uses to trip us up and make us feel stuck are universal. So what I do is um, I had already read through the book once. And so I'm reading it through now on Periscope every Sunday morning for about, you know, 40 minutes or so. We read through as much as we can get through, and we just interact and chat live through video on Periscope. So, um, Hmm. yeah, honestly, it's really healing because when you read a book to yourself, I mean, it's great. But when you read it out loud and and you start getting interactions with other people – and you start getting their point of view and then validations of, yeah, I feel this way. I know what you mean. I think this means that. I think that means this. And, and you start to really get all these perspectives. It really just brings every, every paragraph, every chapter, it brings it to a whole new level of understanding when you're interacting with others as you're reading through a book. So um, it's, it's really been an amazing experience so far as we go through it and – I'm excited to see what happens. Um, You know, as of right now, there's about 200 people that join me every Sunday morning, um, you know, throughout, you know, you know, you know, either live or, or or they'll watch a replay, you know, later on in the day um, to really just enjoy the read through, to share, to spread the word, to help heal together. So I'm, I'm hoping it continues to take off, not for me personally, but because anxiety is such a big part of my life and something that I struggle with. It's another way for me to continue my healing journey and really help inspire others that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a regular guy who has a day job taking care of his family, trying to find my way in life. But, you know, I'm taking every opportunity possible to really just help as many as possible because that's what I feel like my calling really is, um, you know, beyond just my, my nine to five day job is to really, uh, 
raise, take, take my healing journey to as many levels as I possibly can and help as many people as possible because, to me, that's really what it's all about. And that's fantastic. Yeah, it's awesome that you're putting yourself out there like that, uh, Matt. Um, hey, we've got... we, we just have a few, just a couple of minutes left, but we really wanted to get this question in for you. This is um, an important question. Yeah, could you possibly share with our listeners what some of the warning signs are that someone is being abused? Yeah, I mean, that's some of the things that I know I did, things you want to look out for, obviously, are a complete, you know, you know some, if your child, and I'll speak to this as a, you know, from a child perspective, um, things like being withdrawn, no longer interacting with friends, wanting to stay in their room, not wanting to talk anymore, um, not, you know, having less of an appetite, feeling ashamed, all, all these types of things that maybe your child or your friend or some, some other family member never did before, but now all of a sudden they start to um, exhibit these behaviors. I mean, those are absolute mm-hmm. red flag warning signs to just try and talk to that person and, and get them help um, in some way because it's not something you want to ignore. I mean, obviously there are physical signs as well if it's, an, you know, a, a domestic abuse or like, you know, a physical abuse thing where, you know, blatant mm-hmm. signs like, um, you know, physical wounds or scars or whatever, but the Bruising emotional or... effects, right, exactly, yeah. I mean, those are more easily, um, uh, you know, recognizable, so to speak. But the the – the change in habits is really what you want to look out for because I can remember my my parents and family saying Matt was always this happy go lucky kid. He loved everybody, had a good time, played with his toys, played with his friends, and then suddenly something changed. But then nobody ever really acted upon it. Nobody ever really did anything. And right. you know when you when you start to see things happen in your child or your family member's life or whoever it is that just don't seem to add up. There's, there's usually a reason behind it, and, um, you know, that's when you really uh, really want to try and take steps to be there for them, to understand them, to not push them and not try and make them talk until they're ready, but let them know that you're here to listen and really just, um, you know, as I said, some of those really warning signs are just when something is out of the ordinary from, what, from, from the way that they used to be, that's, that's oftentimes a red flag to at least be aware and try to stay on top of, you know, the change and find out what the reason is for it. So th- those are things that I know I did specifically. And, um, you know, looking back, and I've seen it in some other people um, as well that I've talked to with their family members and their kids who have experienced this. Cool. Well, that, well, thank that's, you, thank you for we appreciate, that yeah. we appreciate your insight. You know, I think that's super important that people are always, on the lookout for any of those and, and you know, spending time with, with someone that they ordinarily didn't spend time with. Like in your case, it, you know, they were, they were a family friend, but you know, perhaps somebody should have questioned how much time you were spending with them. So I think that's all well, really, yeah, really exactly. important. Yeah. yeah you know, I, mean, I think you're, you're exactly right because um, you know, I mean, it's one thing, you know, for a 15 and a 16 year old to hang out. But when you've got a 16 year old hanging out with a five year old looking back, I didn't think anything of it, but I mean, that's a red flag that I know now to look out for. So it's really just yeah, being definitely. aware and being involved in, in your child's life as much as possible. So you can be in tune when something does come up. If unfortunately it does that you're aware of it and that you're there to help as soon as possible. Yeah. Absolutely. And Matt, we just, we really appreciate you. We thank you so much for coming on the air with us today, especially, you know, not feeling well and we're just, we're really grateful. So thank you for coming out and, and, and telling us your story and possibly saving some lives out there. You, you just never know who you're going to touch when you, when you do these type of situations. So um, again, we're grateful to you, and uh, we are going to play out with a song uh, by Blake MacGyver. It's called uh, Start to Believe, and um, 
again, thank you, Matt. And if there's anything that we can do to help you in the future, get your message out there and make sure you touch base with us. I absolutely will. Thanks, guys. It was an honor to be on your show. And, um, you know, if we can reach even one person with with just the message of hope, then that's really uh, just an amazing thing. So thank you again. I'm honored to be here. And um, I look forward to having you guys on my show at some point soon, too. Oh, we would we'd, love to do that. We'd just, be honored. And stay on the line with us for just a couple of minutes, okay? I sure will. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks. And you can you can find Matt at survivingmypast.net. Staring down that long and winding road, I felt like I could never start again. Slipping through the pages of my broken life, just remembering when. Before I was yours, I just stumbled through my feeble lies. But now you bring me all I could ask for. You give me all that I need. And baby, you've gathered the pieces. Maybe I'll start to believe. Of that mountain top, I said, How do we begin to climb? Wishing I could speed right through to all the joy, just manipulate time. But now I am yours, so I'll stop wandering through those feeble lies. Cause now you bring me all I could ask for. Doubts closing, I know that you'll be there. I won't despair, my dream come true. Who knew, baby, it's you. And though I falter, I lose control. Your soul pulls me through, baby, it's you. You know just what to do. You bring me all I could ask for. You give me. I guess I'll start. I guess I'll start. I guess I'll start to believe. I guess I'll start. I guess I'll start. I guess I'll start. I guess I'll start to believe. I guess I'll start to believe. Yeah. Join us next week. As Rebecca and Joe continue to battle the stigma of mental illness, follow us on Twitter at Voices for Change RJ and on Facebook at Voices for Change 2.0.